Hey guys, and welcome to Mr. Kevin's Literacy Session. Today we are going to read the story, Pigasso and Mutis, which are a play on some real human artist. Um, Pigasso is a character that is played after a, a real artist named Picasso, but they made him a pig, so they called him Pigasso in the story. And Matisse, Henry Matisse, is another artist, and he is going to be played by a cow in this story, and they named him Mootis. So they're a little play on words. Um, so before we get started today, I just want to run through the lesson plan. We are going to do a little history check on Pablo Picasso. Then we are going to do a history lesson on Henry Matisse um, and talk about their famous artworks that they have painted. And I'll show you a couple of the paintings in the videos. Um, then we're going to read aloud to the story when Picasso met Mutis. And then we're going to discuss a little bit about the story and um, what we got from it and what a feud is. Um, and then we're going to have the first activity. Um, like we're going to talk about the story of the beginning, the middle, and the end. Then I'm just going to show you a video clip just to remind you of some fun facts of Picasso. Then we're going to create a Picasso painting ourselves, And then a fun fact video of Henry Matisse. And then we're going to create a Matisse artwork of ourself. And then we'll have a little reflection. Okay, so now that we know what the lesson plan is, again, you can find this all in our Class Dojo post. We're going to start with gathering materials. So we're going to need quite a few materials for this because we are doing a couple of activities. Um, so first up, um, we're going to need some random household items. You don't have to worry about that right now. Um, we'll gather them during our picture challenge. Um, we are going to need a notebook, some paper, some construction paper. We're going to need some scissors, which I have misplaced. You're going to need some crayons or markers, whichever you prefer. Then we're also going to need some tape or glue, whichever you have. Um, for this one, I'm going to be using glue. And then we're going to just need, uh, whether it's cardboard, um, thicker pieces of paper, or if you just want to use a regular piece of paper, that is fine. Um, to create our artwork, we're just going to need two backgrounds to create our artwork on. Um, I chose these two, they're like thicker poster paper. If you don't have that, that's fine. Like I said, you can choose anything, cardboard, um, regular pieces of paper, whatever is blank that you can create um, your artwork on that we're going to glue stuff to. So they are the materials. We'll go over them for each one activity as we go. Again, we're going to need some thick pieces of paper or cardboard. We're going to need our journal, a pen or pencil, regular paper, construction paper, crayons or markers, and some glue or tape. I know that's a lot for right now, but again, we're trying to gather everything for this entire lesson, and then I will tell you what we need specifically for each one project that we start. So for now, pause the video here and gather those materials. Um, it's also, the materials are also listed in our post, so you can get a little list if you want and check them off. So pause the video here. Once you gather all those materials, unpause. So who was Pablo Picasso? Pablo Picasso is an artist. He was born on October 25th, 1881 in Spain. 
and he died April 8th, 1973 in France. He has a lot of famous paintings that you guys can see at some museums. Um, some of, I'll just name a few. Um, he did a self-portrait, which you might be familiar with, which is this painting here. Um, he also had another work is The Pipes of Pan, which is that one. Then he also has The Three Musicians, The Guernica, and The Weeping Woman. Now he has hundreds of other paintings, but they were just a few that are famous. Um, he is a modern paintist, modern art paintist, um, and he really defined the style of what's called Cubism. Now, Cubism was a different way of painting. Um, the artist began to look at subjects in new ways in efforts to depict three-dimension objects on a flat canvas, um, and they would break up different shapes and paint them at different angles. Uh, so here is one of his, a cubist painting that he created. So now that we know that one, um, let's go back. So Pablo Picasso grew up in Spain. Um, his father was a painter and an art teacher. Pablo liked to draw his entire life. Um, he was not so good at school. Um, he had very little interest in learning about the sciences, um, math, um, but he was extremely talented at being an artist, drawing pictures and painting and sculpting. When he was 14, Pablo attended a famous art school in Barcelona, Spain. Um, a few years later, he went to another school in Spain. Um, however, uh, he got so bored of classical painting, like the Renaissance type paintings, he just wanted to show everyone that there's a different way of doing that, and he created his own style. Um, so he has a period which from 1901 to 1904, which we call the Blue Period. Um, it's his paintings are very sad. Um, it was a hard time in his life. One of his friends did pass away. So a lot of his paintings are very sad and somber looking. And it's called the blue period because blue being sad. And blue because a lot of the tones and colors that he painted with were blue. Um, such as the old guitarist. Then he had a rose period from 1904 to roughly 1906. Um, the colors became a little bit more bright. Um, he was finding his light. He was finding his movement in that time. And what's happening in life is his reflection in his paintings. Um, so we start seeing more like the yellow and rose color tones and the pinkish hues um, that he's using. And then he finally finds his niche. And that's in 1907 through 1921. He started painting his style of cubism. It was a new style of painting. He worked with other artists named uh, Jorge Broke. Um, by 1901, they completed this new style, um, which they called cubism, and was breaking down sections and shapes uh, and putting them back together with different perspectives and angles. And that's what kind of cubism came. Um, they're little weird looking, but they're really neat. I'm uh, just reading a little bit more. Uh, Pablo Picasso was not as famous when he was alive. He really, he wasn't as famous as he is now, I should say. Um, once he passed away, he became really famous and everyone knows who Pablo Picasso is. Uh, so here are a few um, fun facts. His full name is Pablo Diego Jose Francesco de Paula Juan Nipo Muenche Maria de los Ramadios Capriano de Estatismo Trinidad Ruiz y Picasso. Wow, that's a huge, huge name. Um, 
Don't ever name your kids that long. <laughs> um, his mother once told him, if you become a soldier, you'll be a general. If you become a monk, you'll end up as pope. So she was pretty much just telling him whatever he puts his mind to, he's going to be one of the greats. And unfortunately, he didn't get to experience that in his lifetime, but he did become that eventually. Um, he produced over 1,800 paintings and over 1,200 sculptures. That is a lot of artwork. Many of his paintings have been sold for over $100 million. That just goes to show you that he is one of the finest artists. Um, he was married twice and had four children. So that's pretty much it right now, the gist of Pablo Picasso. So let's learn about our other artist, Henry Matisse. So, Henry Matisse was another famous painter and artist. He was born on December 31st, 1869 in France. He died November 3rd, 1954 in France. Um, some of his famous works are The Dinner Table, The Woman with the Hat, The Desert, um, Harmony in Red, and The Red Studio. So Henry Matisse's um, style um, he was another father of modern art in the painting world. Um, his um, style was called Fauvism. And Fauvism is where they took bright colors in which objects and people were represented in a non-realistic way. Um, so maybe like a tree would be like this weird blob of green. Um, that's what that means. Henry Matisse uh, grew up in the northern part of France. His father was a grain merchant um, and very strict with Henry. Um, he went to the school, an art school in Paris, where he got a little bit bored, but he had to study something other than art because his parents weren't thinking that was a great career. Um, so he was studying law. In 1888, he passed the bar and took a job as a law clerk. He really became a paint painter in 1889. Um, during, he got very sick. He needed to get an apodectomy. His appendix burst. During his recovery, his mom got him some art supplies and for something to do because he was bedridden. Um, and he fell in love with painting. And that's where he discovered that this was the career that he should follow. And dad wasn't happy, but Henry Matisse did become very famous. Um, so his earlier works that I showed you, The Dinner Table, was one of his pretty much first paintings that took the art world. Um, so his style was called Fauvism. In the early 1900s, he developed this new style. He began to paint, like I said, these bright masses of colors um, where they were freely applied. He used other colors to express emotion, often using colors that had nothing to do with the natural colors of the subject. So if an orange is orange, he may have painted it like blue. Um, the world was very critical about his work, um, but then later to loved it. Some, let's see what else. Some interesting facts about Henry Matisse. Um, he was good friends with the artist Pablo Picasso um, and later became rivals and had a feud, which is, you'll see in the story, Picasso met Matisse. Um, a major patron of Matisse's included the Americans, the Gertrude Steins, and the Kuhn sisters. Um, they purchased a number of his paintings. He also introduced them to Picasso, whose paintings were also purchased. Um, he ran a small art school called the Academia Matisse in Paris between 1908 and 1911. 
Um, some of his paintings have sold for over $20 million, which is still a ton of money. Not as much as Picasso, but still. Um, and Al Pacino is set to play him in a role called Masterpiece. So these are just a few fun facts um, about Henry Matisse. So now, now that we know a little bit more about the artist, um, why don't we go ahead and read the story when Picasso met Matisse. But before we do that, um, we want to listen for the following word, um, feud. So a feud is when two people have an argument over each other and their works got involved with that. Um, so when we're hearing, listening to the story, um, we want to know what the problem is in the story, what caused the problem, how was the, was the problem solved, and how, um, and what do we think the characters learned, and did they remain friends after this feud? So think of those questions when we're listening to the story. All right, here's the story. Hi, welcome to SAG Foundation's Book Pals Storyline Online. My name is Eric Close, and today I'm going to be reading When Pegaso Met Mutis, written and illustrated by Nina Layden. There once was a young pig named Pegaso. While the other piglets rolled in the mud and played games, Pegaso painted. He painted anything and everything, and in a most unusual way. At the same time, there once was a young bull named Mutis. Mutis was not like the other bulls. He wasn't interested in bullfighting. Mutis was happy only when he painted pictures. And he painted big, bold, bright pictures. In time, word of Pegaso's talent spread throughout the pig provinces. Soon, art-loving pigs from all over lined up to buy his creations. At the same time, Mutis was getting famous in the cattle community. There weren't many households that didn't own a mooster piece. Pegaso and Mutis were becoming art superstars. But this came with a price. Everybody wanted to see them. Art buyers, art sellers, art students, art historians, art groupies. It was an art attack. One day, Pegaso got fed up and said, I am tired of this noisy pig pen. At the same time, Mutis declared, I'm sick of this crowded cow town. Needing a change, they both decided to look for a peaceful place where they could paint without distractions. So each of the two artists looked far and wide for the perfect spot. Pegaso found a lovely farm looking towards the east. Mutis found a handsome farm facing the west. After Pegaso moved in, he went to introduce himself to his new neighbor across the road. At the same time, Mutis went to introduce himself to his new neighbor across the road. Bonjour. Bonjour. That is how Pegaso met Mutis. And coincidentally, that is how Mutis met Pegaso. At first, Pegaso and Mutis were friendly and welcomed each other as neighbors. But soon, things began to change. It started one day when Pegaso criticized one of Mutis's paintings. Then Mutis made fun of one of Pegaso's. Mutis called Pegaso an art hog. Then Pegaso called Mutis a mad cow. Mutis quipped, You paint like a two-year-old! Pegaso retorted, You paint like a wild beast! Mutis raged, Your colors look like mud! Pegaso spat, your paintings look like color by numbers. <laughs> then, things really got out of hand. It was a modern art mess. Pegaso stormed off into his house. That Mutis doesn't like my art, he huffed. Well, I'll show him. And Mutis bullied his way into his house. I'll give that Picasso something he can really criticize, he snorted. Then, a full-scale feud erupted. 
but it was a most unusual battle. Armed with ladders and buckets of paint, Mutis launched the first attack. He started at dawn. By the end of the evening, he had succeeded in transforming the outside of his house into a monster-sized mooster piece. Not to be outdone, Pegaso fired up his paintbrushes and in full view of the enemy, counterattacked. He turned his farm into a huge and outrageous pork of art. The two artists then retreated into their houses and pulled down the shades. Pegaso certainly didn't want to look out his window and stare at a Mutis. And Mutis had no desire to give his rooms a view of a Pegaso. This presented a problem, and there seemed to be only one solution. Without a word to each other, Pegaso and Mutis each began to build a huge wooden fence down the middle of their road. At first, Pegaso and Mutis seemed satisfied. Both artists went back to painting by themselves, but after a while, Pegaso was surprised to find that he missed that bullheaded Mutis. At the same time, Mutis found his studio empty without the presence of pig-headed Pegaso. Pegaso pondered, that Mutis isn't such a bad artist. He has some interesting ideas. Mutis moaned, oh, that Pegaso may not paint like me, but he knows what he is doing. However, being naturally pig-headed, and bullheaded, neither artist knew how to apologize to the other. So they did what they do best. They let their paintbrushes do the talking. Pegaso painted on one side of the fence, and Mutis painted on the other. Each worked until they were exhausted. It was strangely quiet when they were done. Then, Curious to see what Mutis had been doing, Pegaso sprinted around to the other side. At the same time, Mutis galloped over to Pegaso's side. The silence was broken as the two artists began laughing at their amazing work of heart. From that day on, Pegaso and Mutis became great friends. They happily took down the fence and shared their different views. A few months later, a big museum bought the fence. Pegaso called his side when Pegaso met Mutis. Mutis called his side when Mutis met Pegaso. The critics called it incredible. Now, Pegaso and Matisse weren't actually a pig and a bull. They were really two of the greatest artists of the 20th century. And if you get the chance, I really encourage you to go and check out their paintings in the museum. They are beautiful and I think you'll love them. Thanks for listening. So for this activity, um, right now we just need the piece of paper um, and maybe the pen or pencil and whatever you prefer, the crayons or the markers, whichever. So it's the crayons and markers. Oops, I just dropped my crowns. A pen and the blank piece of paper. That's all that's needed for this activity right now. So we're going to um, take this piece of paper and fold it in threes. Again, the easiest way to do that is rolling it kind of like this and making sure once the this piece of end touches the other, and this is kind of wrapped, just flatten it like that. Make sure you really crease those seams. And then we have three somewhat equal pieces of sections of paper. Okay, I'm just trying to get this to my clipboard. Okay, so we have three sections. Um, in the first section, we're going to write beginning. So that's B, E, G, I, N, N, I, N, G.
Then we're going to have middle. M I D D L E. Middle. Beginning, middle, and end. E N D. So now we have three columns. So in these three columns, um, we're going to draw the pictures in each column retelling the story. So we're going to draw the picture of what happened in the beginning of when Picasso met Mutis, what happened in the middle, and what happened in the end. So again, we just folded the paper into threes wrote beginning, middle, and end. Okay, guys, so now that we have our paper folded into our three squares, we wrote beginning, middle, and end. So we're going to draw a picture of what happened in the beginning of the story. <clears throat> so you can choose a specific event if you like. I drew two pictures here. Um, the pictures that I drew are in the beginning, um, Picasso and Mutisse were happy um, and they loved and enjoy pain being painting things. So I drew a picture of Picasso painting and then I wrote happy times and then things got kind of out of hand. Um, their fame and people wanting more and pressure from their fans. Um, it became a little bit overwhelming, so I drew, um, became too much is what I wrote, and I drew Picasso hiding behind his canvas. So that's kind of what happened in the beginning. Um, and the same thing happened with Mutisse. Um, for the middle of the story, um, they both moved away and they moved across from each other and they were neighbors. So um, that happened. But then they started fighting and this is where the feud came about. And they were angry and they bashed each other's paintings and all that type of stuff. Um, so I drew that as my middle. Um, I drew them shouting at each other, um, Mutis and Pegaso. And I wrote feud. So that. And in the end, um, after a while, they got along and they put their differences aside and really helped each other grow as artists. Um, and they painted this fence, which was actually a real thing, um, and they sold it. Um, so in the end, I wrote Friends to the End, and that's the fence that they painted. Um, Mutis is half, and then Picasso is half, and then they just have armor on each other. So it was the end. So they were happy, and then they got scared. They didn't want fame anymore. And they met each other and had a feud. And then they lived kind of happily ever after. Um, so yeah, so that is my beginning, middle, end storyboard. Um, take your time. I drew these quickly. Um, take your time and draw what you think happened in the beginning of the story. And draw the feud. Um, I just drew them yelling at each other. You might want to draw them throwing paint, um, whatever you guys like, and then draw their happy ending. Um, take the time and you can color these with your crayons or markers. And that's this for this exercise, guys. I guess. Now let's watch a quick video clip of some fun facts of Henry Matisse just to refresh our brain. Um, and after the video, we'll start our activity. Hello, my name is Paul Priestley. Welcome to Artist in School, the home of art history for young people and for interested amateurs. Today, I'm going to be telling you 10 really interesting facts about the French artist Henri Matisse. Fact number one. He was born in 1869 into a very prosperous family. His parents had big ambitions for him. So he went to university and he got a law degree. But at the age of 22, he got appendicitis and spent some weeks convalescing at home. 
His mother gave him a box of paints and he played around with these for some time and eventually realised that he quite liked painting. So decided to give up the law and take up painting. His father was not very pleased. Fact number two. In 1892, he applied to the École des Beaux-Arts, the best art school in France, but failed the entrance exam. So what he decided to do was to stand outside the École des Beaux-Arts every morning when the tutors arrived and accidentally, on purpose, bump into them with his drawings. He did this for a number of weeks and eventually one of the tutors, an artist called Gustav Moreau, invited him into his classes and he sat at the back. But in 1894 he applied to the École des Beaux-Arts again and again failed. He eventually succeeded in 1895 at the age of 26. Fact number three. In 1894, his girlfriend Caroline gives birth to his daughter Marguerite. Caroline effectively works as his housekeeper. You can see her here in the painting laying the table. He enjoys life. He sits in nice comfortable chairs like this one and spends most of his time painting while she works around the house. Fact number four. In 1900, he bought a painting by Cézanne. Cézanne he calls the god of painting. Up to this point, Matisse's paintings are quite dull. But once he gets into Cézanne, he begins to copy some of Cézanne's ideas, as you can see here his paintings begin to start developing. Fact number five. Remember that Matisse is a very conservative person. Yet in 1905, he meets two artists, André Durin and Maurice Vlaminck, both of whom were very bohemian characters. In fact, Matisse's family think they're nothing but drug addicts and drunkards. Yet the three of them together create this new form of painting called Fauvism, which is very extreme, very bright, very colourful. Matisse's paintings suddenly become very avant-garde, as you can see here. Fact number six. In 1912, he visits Morocco and he is fascinated by the light and the colour of the North African country. But what fascinates him most is that when he goes into cafes and bars, he sees men smoking the hooker pipes, but staring at bowls of goldfish. And these goldfish become part of many of his paintings. Fact number seven. Matisse had married his wife, Amélie, in 1898. But in 1917, she chose to stay at home while he traveled to the south of France with a young Italian model called Lorette. He painted 50 very intimate paintings of Lorette during the six months that he stayed in Nice, as you can see here. Fact number eight. By the time Matisse was in his late 50s, his paintings were selling very well. In fact, so well that in 1924, he renegotiates his gallery contract so that he earns higher commission from his paintings. In fact, his exhibition of that year sold out in one day. Fact number nine. During the Second World War, Matisse gets cancer. He's operated on in 1941, and the operation is successful, but it leaves him as an invalid in a wheelchair. He's nursed back to health by a group of nuns, but this takes nearly two years. To repay the nuns, Matisse decides to design and pay for the rebuilding of their new church at Vence in the south of France. It produces a very Matisse-like church, as you can see here. It's a beautiful place to visit. Fact number 10. Matisse spends the last few years of his life bedridden, but that does not stop him from creating art. He's given up painting, but he's now taken up a pair of scissors and he cuts out collages from huge sheets of coloured paper that he has printed for him. And he produces some wonderful artwork, as you can see here. 
These are probably the best collages that have ever been produced. Thank you for watching Artist in School, the home of art history for young people. I hope you've enjoyed the video. If you have, please give it a like. I would really appreciate that. If you've really enjoyed the video, then please subscribe to my channel. You can do so by clicking on this picture of me here. That would be much appreciated. Thank you very much for watching. Okay, now for our next activity, we're going to create a piece of artwork in the style of Henry Matisse. So we're going to need the following material from what we gathered. We're going to need some heavy-duty paper, like I said it was the cardboard or the post paper, anything that's pretty sturdy that you are going to put your artwork on. If you don't have anything, you can use a regular piece of paper, that is fine as well. But this is going to be your, what we call, your canvas. Then we need some construction paper. Whatever you have on hand is fine. We're going to need a black marker. We're going to need some scissors. I have them this time. We're also going to need some glue or tape, whichever you prefer. I'm using glue for right now. Then some crayons or markers, whatever you guys prefer. Doesn't matter. You can use both, you can use one. Doesn't matter, up to you guys. Again, we're going to need crayons or markers, whichever you prefer. Glue, black marker, scissors, construction paper, and your canvas, which is either cardboard, poster board, or a regular piece of paper. So once we have those materials in front of us, we are going to set our little space up and begin our activity. Okay, now let's get started creating our own artwork, Henry Matisse style. So the first thing, step one, is we're going to choose doesn't matter. Choose a couple colors. Um, I'm just going to randomly grab these things. Okay, so I chose a couple colors. See, I chose a couple. And we are going to cut out some geometric shapes. So I want simple shapes. Um, we're going to cut out squares, rectangles, and triangles. Um, don't think of any other shapes right now. <laughs> Just squares, rectangles, and triangles right now. Um, cut them out different sizes and different colors. We want to cut out enough to cover our canvas. Um, so we'll be cutting other sh shapes a little bit later, but step one, we're just going to color, cut out squares, triangles, and rectangles enough to cover your canvas. Okay, so this is my canvas. I want to make sure I have enough to cover out. So remember, they could be different shapes and sizes. Um, and there's going to be a lot of them. So I'm just going to show you a quick example. So I just cut what I call like a bookmark size thing. Um, they don't have to be perfect. And I'm going to cut that. And look, I have one yellow square. And then we still have this, and you just keep going. And that simple, I have five yellow squares. Perfect. Um, you want to do them different colors. I'm still using this paper. Maybe I want a bigger one. Um, let's try rectangles this time. So I'm going to do this. Cut one from there. Cut another one. I got four rectangles out of that one. 
And then I'll just cut these in half and have two kind of squares and rectangles. So from one piece of paper, I got a lot of pieces out. Um, you're going to continue that with a few other different colors. Uh, choose whatever colors you like. I'll make sure we're doing different shapes. So I am going to cut the corners to get my triangles. If you cut the four corners, then you will have four little triangles. Perfect, right? So then, for the edges like that, you just want to kind of bring it in to get more triangles. Like so. Make sure your parents are helping you or supervising you when cutting. What a shape was for a second. Um, so I have a couple of triangles that are green. Um, maybe I'll draw So I'm going to fast forward here, so um, you can pause the video here, um, cut out, I would say like four or five different colors of different shapes. So you can have yellow triangles, yellow rectangles, yellow squares. Um, try to have those three shapes in four or five different colors. So take the time and cut them out. Here, so pause the video until you have four or five couple shapes to enough to cover your canvas. Now that we have a few shapes, basic shapes, um, we're going to now in a different set of colors, or if you want to continue those colors, that's fine. We're going to cut out more like different shapes. Um, a little bit more intricate shapes, so like lightning bolts or squigglies and circles or whatever shape you kind of want to create. Um, I will show in a perfect example. So I am just going to randomly cut a goofy shape like that. It doesn't mean anything, just random shape. And in order to save some paper, you already have these shapes here, like that. So you can cut that out. Um, or if you take like a square, you can fold it if you like, and cut like so. Then I have this shape, but without wasting paper, I also have this shape. So now I have two. And we have cool things like that. So cut whatever you like out. Random shapes. You can cut lightning bolts. Um, I'll try to do a lightning bolt right now. I apologize if this isn't cool looking. Ah, oh, it came out alright. That's like my little lightning bolt right there. Um, whatever you want, these shapes, um, try to do other colors or the same colors that we have. Um, cut it out, mm, let's say about like 10 of those shapes. All right, so pause here and cut those shapes out. So step three, we're going to glue the shapes um, not the intricate ones, the basic shapes, the triangles, the squares, and the rectangles. We're going to start gluing them to our canvas. 
And when you're gluing them down, you want to make sure that sometimes they're overlapping. Right, hold on, I'm going to show you in a second. I just made some too long. So when I glue it down, um, we'll glue it. You kind of want to show some overlapping. Overlapping just means putting on top of. And then sometimes we want to have some space. So see, uh, it's kind of hard to see because it's not glued down. So the blue and the orange are over, or yellow, are overlapping, and the green is gapped. And gapped means that it's not touching any of the other colors. It's just on the canvas. So you can rearrange um, whatever you like, however you want on the, your canvas. Um, we'll work this out together. Sorry, I'm unorganized a little bit. I lost my glue. So now we're just, like I said, we're just doing the basic shapes, which were the triangles, squares, and rectangles. So we're going to glue. You don't need to cover just the corners. Don't waste your glue. I just put four dots, maybe like a little line, a little bit in the middle. Like so. We're not trying to waste your glue or run out anything like that. So say four dots in the corner, which were big, and just a little quick spread. And then we're going to place that on our canvas. Yours does not have to match mine. This is your artwork, guys. So you create whatever you want. Like so. So take the other colors. Let's match them up. Okay, I'm going to don't cover the entire thing just yet because we have other shapes to put on. Like so. And then I'm gonna take some of my green ones. that. I want to use a different color. Running out of glue here. I'm gonna call, and you can title your piece if you like. I'm gonna call this one My Neighborhood. You can call it whatever you guys like. And remember, the representation of it is there, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's what they look like. And now the glue here. Here we go. So just to give you a brief example, um, I have these shapes. Don't worry, these will kind of go away um, once you flatten it. So I used the rectangle, another rectangle, a square, more triangles, like so. Um, once you have a good covering, you can add a few more, you can add a little bit, whatever you guys prefer. Start adding the intricate um, shapes and glue them on top of these. So I will... So I made um, this little intricate shape. Uh, so I made like a little swirly. 
Um, I'm going to glue that and I'm going to kind of glue it in the center. That's where I'm going to glue that one at. So it's going to be a little bit hard to glue this because it's thin. Again, I'm just going to glue dots all over just to make sure it stays. Try not to waste my glue. Okay. So you can paste your intri intricate shapes like the lightning bolt or the swirlies or whatever shapes you guys decided to draw. Um, make sure they go on top of our triangles. My glue is overseen. That's okay. We expect that. You just rub the glue off if it starts getting on your hands. Um, like so. So you guys continue um, pasting and gluing whatever you like for that type of stuff. So I, whatever shapes you guys prefer, and you can pause here, and I'm going to work on this. I don't need to continue working on this while you guys are just watching. Um, so you can pause here um, and get whatever you want, whatever you need on here, and then I will share my artwork with you and another one that I created last time when I practiced this. Okay, so let's see what you can create. So I wanted to share with you guys um, my one that I did. Um, so this is my Henry Matisse style painting. And I am going to call this one um, My Neighborhood. Doesn't represent a neighborhood, but you could kind of see little elements. Um, these kind of look like houses, um, but that's the whole idea. So that's what mine looks like. I have to do a little bit better job of gluing down, but I just wanted to show you guys really quick. Whatever you create, and like every good artist, um, you guys should always sign your work. So we're going to take that black marker. And on the back of our canvas, we are going to sign our name. And if you want to date it, you can. I'm going to date mine. Um, today is 5 6 20, 20. So again, I signed, um, I autographed it, um, and then I dated it. Um, and that's my artwork. So this is my Henry Matisse style art. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, please share your Matisse style with everyone. Post your picture in the comments or post your picture in um, your child portfolio so we can see what you guys worked with or you can take a picture of yourself holding it, whatever you like. Please share your artwork with us so we guys, so we can share with all of you. Um, so let's go. Once we're done here, take your time. Um, once you're done with your Matisse style, we are going to move on to Picasso. Now let's watch a video of Pablo Picasso. These are a couple interesting facts about him, just again to refresh our brain. Um, and then we'll start that activity. Hello, my name is Paul Priestley. Welcome to Artist in School, the home of art history for young people and for interested amateurs. Today, I'm going to be telling you 10 really interesting facts about the great artist Pablo Picasso. Fact number one. He was born in Malaga in Spain in 1881. His father was a man called Don Ruiz. His mother was Maria Picasso. But in Spain, they tend to take the mother's surname, not the father's surname. So he became known as Pablo Picasso, not Pablo Ruiz. Fact number two. He was a prodigious talent. 
At the age of eight, he'd sold his first painting. At the age of nine, he had a studio. By the time he's 12, 13, 14 years old, he's producing drawings and paintings like these. These paintings and drawings could go into any gallery in the world and they wouldn't look out of place. And he's just 11, 12 and 13 years old. Fact number three. Picasso's father was an art teacher and he got the job at the prestigious Barcelona School of Art in 1894. Picasso enrolled at the Barcelona School of Art at the age of 13. Normally you have to be 18 to enter. But he was so talented. But he was only there until he was 16 because at the age of 16 he got bored and he wanted to move on. So he moved to Madrid and he entered the prestigious San Fernando Royal College of Art in Madrid at the age of 16. The entrance exam lasted a month. Picasso did it in a week because he's a genius. Fact number four. At the age of 18, he left the college in Madrid and he went to Paris with his best friend, Carlo Casajemus. Carlo Casajemus was walking down the street one day when he shot himself, claiming that his girlfriend didn't want to see him anymore. His girlfriend was going out with Picasso two weeks later, but that's another story. Shortly after this, Picasso began to paint lots of paintings in blue. He painted people who were disabled, who were blind, who were lonely, who were depressed. Some years later, someone interviewed him and asked him, why did you paint all these pictures in blue? Was it because you were depressed at the death of your friend Casajemus? Picasso said no. He said, was it because you were in Paris all on your own and you were lonely? Picasso said no. So the man said, why did you paint all the paintings in blue? And Picasso thought, and he said simply, it's because I had lots of blue paint. Fact number five. In 1909-1910, Picasso worked with an artist called Georges Braque, and together they invented a new style of painting called Cubism. Cubism was based on the idea that paintings are painted on a flat surface, and for centuries artists had tried to make that flat, flat surface look three-dimensional by using perspective. Picasso and Braque went about it in a totally different way. They decided that a sculpture, for example, you can walk all the way around it. It's three-dimensional. You can't walk around a painting. So what they decided to do was to draw an object, like a person, from lots of different angles, from the back, front, the sides, and put all of those drawings together to make one image. Hence, this sort of thing. People looked at it, couldn't understand what it was. But if you look carefully, you can see the clues and therefore read the painting. Fact number six. In 1918, he married a Russian ballerina called Olga Koklova. This is his painting of Olga with his son Paolo. She doesn't look like a ballerina, does she? But that's because you're looking at the painting from your point of view. With Picasso, you've got to be cleverer than that. Look at the painting from Paolo's point of view. If you are a young child, everything revolves around your mother. Your mother is big. She's the whole world. Look at the background of the picture. There's nothing there because the world does not exist to a child of six months old. The mother is the world. Then you understand the painting. Fact number seven. In 1936, there was a civil war going on in Spain and Franco, the leader of the fascist movement, was also a friend of Hitler. Hitler loaned Franco some bombers and they tested them out on a little town called Guernica. At 10 to three on one particular afternoon, Guernica was just a normal town of around 6,000 people. By three o'clock on that same day, Guernica looked like this and 3,000 people had died during those 10 minutes. Picasso was appalled at the carnage that had gone on that afternoon, and he painted his most famous picture, Guernica, based on that incident. 
I'm not going to talk about the whole painting because that will take too long. But just look in the bottom left hand corner at the hand. Can you see the hand is open like this? In the original drawings for the painting, the hand is clenched in a fist because the people who were fighting against the fascists would draw fists on buildings as a means of resistance. We're going to resist the fascists. But Picasso realised that you don't end wars by doing this. You end wars by doing that. Shaking hands and talking. Fact number eight. When Picasso was in his 60s, he was walking down the street with a friend one day and he passed a group of five-year-old children playing. And he turned to his friend and he said, when I was their age, I could draw and paint like Raphael. It's taken me a lifetime to learn how to draw and paint like they do. He didn't mean that he wanted to literally paint like a five-year-old. What he meant was he wanted to use their enthusiasm, their lack of inhibition, their ability just to do what they want to do when they want to do it. Fact number nine. In 1959, the painting La Belle Hollandaise by Picasso, painted in 1905, sold at auction for £55,000, the equivalent of a million pounds today. At the time, it was the world record price for a painting by a living artist. Fact number 10, two quotes. The first one by Picasso. Picasso once said, I'm always doing the things I can't do because that's how I get to do them. So if you want to be great at something, don't ever give up. Quote number two by his mother. She once said to him, if you wanted to be a soldier, you work so hard, you'd never give up. You would have ended up being a general. If you'd have wanted to be a monk, you work so hard, you'd never give up. You would have ended up becoming the Pope. But instead, you chose to be an artist and you work so hard, you never gave up. You ended up becoming Pablo Picasso, the greatest artist in the world. Thank you for watching Artist in School. I hope you've enjoyed the video of Picasso. If you have, perhaps you could give it a like. Maybe you could also subscribe to this channel. That will be much appreciated. And if you can tell your friends about the channel, that will be wonderful. Thank you for watching. So for this activity, we're going to create our own version of a Pablo Picasso style artwork. Um, we don't need much material because we already had it from our first, our second activity. Um, so it's already here. But just a reminder, we're going to need our canvas, which is the poster board, cardboard, or another blank piece of paper, something different from the one we just used. We're going to need glue, a black marker, scissors, construction paper, and crayons or markers, whichever you guys prefer. Again, crayons or markers, scissors, black marker, glue, construction paper, and a new canvas. Whichever you prefer. Um, so then by the end of this, we'll have two canvases, one of Henry and Matisse style artwork that we did, and then we'll have another one, which will be Pablo Picasso style artwork that we did. Again, if you don't remember what I just said, you can rewind or just go to Class Dojo in our post, um, and those items will be listed for this activity. Okay, so now we're going to create our um, second piece of artwork. This is our third activity, but our second piece of artwork. We're going to draw, get our new canvas. Like I said, it's a thick paper. 
Um, and now this one has eight steps. <clears throat> I'm going to read the instructions first. <coughs> Sorry. I'm going to read the instructions first, and then um, I'll break it down step by step. So step one, we're going to draw a large oval in the center of the art paper, which is our canvas. Step two, we're going to divide the oval in half using a zigzag or squiggly line. Then uh, three, we're going to draw three or more eyes, two noses, two mouths, um, and explain that these can um, be drawn, you could draw anywhere on your face, which we'll get to that. Step four, we're using sh shapes like triangles, rectangles, and squares, um, we're going to add ears and hair. Um, they can be more than two ears. They can be located anywhere on the face. Step five, we're going to draw a triangle below the face um, for the neck and shoulders. And then we're going to add, ge add, add geometric patterns to them, shapes inside that triangle. Um, we can draw that. Um, we can cut out shapes. We can color that, whatever you guys prefer. I'm using a dark thing, so I'm not going to be coloring anything. I'm just going to be using construction paper. But if you're using a white or lighter color um, paper, that's fine. You can color them in using your markers or crayons. Uh, after that, we're going to cut more of those geometric shapes out to add to the background. And then step seven, we're going to trace the drawing with a black marker. And then step eight, we're going to color the portrait with bold colors using our crowns and markers. Like I said, I'm using a dark piece of paper. So I will be, you know, using construction paper. Okay. That sounds like a lot, but this is going to be a self-portrait of yourself, Picasso style. So, step one is draw a large oval in the center of the paper. So I'm going to draw it first. It's hard for me to draw this way. So I will share with you guys. So there's my oval. You don't have to fold the paper in half. I just, that's how I stored it. Um, so there's my oval. You can see a little bit. I'll show you with the light in the center of the paper. That is step one. Now step two, we're going to divide the oval in half using a zigzag or a squiggly line. Now it doesn't mention what half. It doesn't have to be straight up and down. It could be across, down, angle, whatever you prefer. I'm going to Do mine like that. Yours doesn't have to be the same. It could go up and down, like I said, or across, or another diagonal. It could be squiggly. It can be tighter. Um, whatever you guys prefer with your design. So that's step one. Draw the oval. Step two. Make a zigzag or squiggly line, cutting that oval in half. Now, because this is a face, this is our face, um, we're going to draw three or more eyes, two noses, and two mouths. So, I'm going to draw one of my eyes closed. In doing so, I'm just going to fold that and draw some little eyelashes on that. And then I'm going to draw my other eye kind of down here. Remember, they don't have to be where your normal eyes are. They just could be anywhere. But I'm going to have him looking out that way. Like that. And then I'm going to draw another eye in the center of my head. Like I said, guys, you can draw them anywhere as you like. They don't have to match mine. I drew three eyes. 
Um, then I'm going to draw a nose. So my nose, I'm going to draw like this. I kind of drew it to the side, so like that. And then another nose, I'm going to draw... Like so. It's weird looking, right? It's kind of like an alien. And then I'm going to draw two mouths, but I'm going to put them in the same one. One, I'm going to have a giant smile. And then I'm going to go into a closed lip for the other. So I drew two smiles. I drew that one, this half right here, smiling, and then I just drew lips for the other one. So that is step three. Step three is drawing two mouths, three eyes, and two noses. Okay. Uh, step four. We are using shapes to draw, um, like triangles, rectangles, to draw hair and ears and all that. So I'm going to draw a triangular ear. Like so. That's my one ear. And then I'm going to draw a, uh, a rectangle ear, like so. Because this ear would be for this half of the face, and that ear would be for this half of the face. Now for my hair, I'm going to go a little crazy. I'm not going. I'm going to draw more of a squiggly hair thing. I'm going to draw three strands, and I'll show you guys in a second. I did like a little snake shape for my hair. Um, so I'm going to draw quite a few of them, more than three this time. I'll show you guys in a second. Like so. And then I am going to step five. Um, I'm going to draw a triangle below the head as the body and shoulders, so it's going to represent the neck and the shoulders. Um, you can either do it like this way, or this way, um, kind of like that, or that, whichever you prefer. Um, so I'm going to draw my triangle like that. So this is going to represent my neck and my shoulders. And then we're just going to draw patterns inside that. Um, so I'm going to kind of draw two colors. I'm going to draw like kind of like a tie, kind of like a collar tie type thing. And then just do like I'm going to do pinstripe shirt. So I'm going to do little stripes and then a thick stripe. And a little stripe. A little stripe. And then do a thick stripe. Little stripe. Thick stripe. And then a little stripe. So I did that type thing. You can draw whatever pattern. You can draw circles. Whatever you guys prefer.
but make sure it stays with inside that triangle. And that would be step five. If I'm going too fast, that's okay, guys. You can pause at each step if you like. Okay, now step seven is we're going to add shapes and colors to the background. I'm just using a black marker. You guys can be using a pencil. I should have told you that in the beginning. I apologize. Um, so we're going to draw a pattern in the back. Uh, I'm just going to draw... random circles through it. You guys can draw whatever you like in the background. See the circles in the back? We're going to cover each. So then I'm going to do a thin line, a thin line, then a thick line, because we'll color that in later. So under my circles, I drew a thin line, and then I drew a thick line, and then another thin line set. So my my circles, my thin line, my thick line, my thin line again, and then I'm going to draw the circles again. Guys, don't worry about the, the colors. There's no wrong way to do this. And then I'm going to continue. I drew my circles, and then I'm just going to continue that pattern throughout just to make it a little bit easier. So I'm going to draw the thin line again, and the thick line, and the thick line is probably going to be it for me because that will be the whole thing. So I have a background, as you can kind of see it. There we go. Um, the circles, the lines, and that runs throughout on top of this weird painting um, that I did. So, step seven says trace the drawing with a black marker. Um, if you did it in black marker already, you already did step seven. That saves time. That's why I think I did that. Um, and then step eight is color this in bold colors. Um, because I have a dark background, um, you're not really going to see my color. So I'm actually going to cut these shapes out and glue them on there. Um, so, like, just, no, I need a circle. I don't have a circle, but, um, like so. Um, just pretend, hold on, I'll cut, I'll cut this out really quick to show you an example. So for one of my backgrounds, I'm using the, the thin line, see it there? The thin lines. Um, I'll cut out this shape and put that on there for the background. Um, like I said, you can use coloring. Coloring is a lot easier if you're using crayons and markers. If not, you can cut those shapes out um, and then glue them on. But then make sure we are bordering them again. So then you could see Let me show you a quick example. I'm just going to color these out just so you guys can see. So if you do use construction paper, you're going to make sure you have that border on there so they really stand out, okay? That's if you're using construction paper. If not, just color in those lines. All right. And that would be it for our Picasso self-portrait. Um, so pause here and take your time to draw them out. Okay, and I will show you mine once you unpause. Okay, so now you should be done your self-portrait Picasso style. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you guys mine. Um, like a great artist when you're creating things, um, you have a tendency to change up a little bit. I did change my squiggly line when I was cutting these shapes out. Um, but this is my Picasso. Um, this is what I'm entitling um, self-portrait. Uh, so I changed my squiggly line a little bit um, to become this one ear, and then I have the other ear here. 
And then I just outlined the face and the body portion stuff, and I kept the background kind of open, just so it would pop out more. So this is my Picasso self-portrait. Um, I hope you guys like it. So today, we created um, three activities or works of art. Um, we had our beginning, middle, and end of our story. <coughs> We had our Matisse style works, and then we had our Picasso style works. Um, again, make sure you sign all your work so people know who did it. You can date it if you like. Um, so yeah. On to the reflection. So in our journal, um, you can write this, draw this, or just verbally tell us in the video, and you can post it and share it with us. Um, I want you to tell me what artist technique did you like most? Did you like Picasso's style, or did you like Matisse's style? Why? Why did you choose that one style over the other? Um, so you can respond to us in the comment section. Um, you could send a picture of the artwork that you like the most, um, make a video response answering those questions, um, or write it in your journal. Um, write the artist that you prefer, Picasso or Matisse, and why you like their technique over the other. All right. Again, this is all written in Class Dojo the post for today. All right, guys. Thanks for joining me for today's literacy session. See you next time.